person or dies, my academy colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, if you have to speak after lunch, you are taking a great risk. And at the top of it, if you are speaking after Professor Prashan, you are taking still a great risk. <laughs> but as a finance person, we have to take a risk. Because a person who takes no risk is nothing, can't do anything. So if we have to do it, we have to take the risk. And that's the risk I'm going to take for this particular session. A broad canvas, uh, canvas has already been drawn and uh, I will be just picking up one area from that broad canvas that is uh, related to global integration of the financial systems. When Prasha, Professor Prasha was saying that uh, the whole world is your market Local markets are not the market. The whole world is your market. He is referring to global integration. And we can't imagine our lives without this global inter integration. But to manage the risk of it, we have to educate ourselves. We have to understand it. We have to appreciate the implications of it. We have to look plus side of it, minus side of it. And that's what I'm trying to share with you this afternoon, this afternoon session. <laughs> to begin with, uh, I share with you, it says, uh, if you don't follow the events happening across globe, we are missing some amazing drama. So if you believe that you can be a successful person by looking at the local events, you are missing a great thing. You can't ignore what's happening across the borders. And that shows the importance of global integration, which is very, very important. And now we cannot ignore this kind of integration. Global integration, liberalization, competition, in fact, they are going side by side. Without liberalization, globalization is not possible and without competition, you can't visualize the effective integration. We can't have the integration between very, very strong people and very, very weak people. Integration has to be in between somewhat equals. And that calls for the competition. So we can't imagine liberalization, competition, integration as stand-alone pieces. They are the integrated part. And if we are missing them, we are missing the real drama of the life. When we read uh, this kind of uh, news, Tata Steel takes over the chorus. You can imagine the dimensions of it. Indian players going outside, buying another company. Do you think? It would have been possible without integration? Obviously not. The money the Tata Steel required to finance it, do you think they get everything of it at the lowest cost within India? Impossible. We have to look outside. And that speaks the importance of the integration. Without integration, such, can, such kind of deals cannot be through. And we cannot dare to think of uh, having such kind of deals. Though others may come to India and buy Indian companies, but we are also going out and buying companies outside. That's the way the liberalization, integration, competition should work. It means that the whole world is my play field. The scale of operations is very, very high, crossing the boundaries. Global financial markets are for, for us we cannot constrain ourselves to the local markets. We have access to all financial markets at all, and we can raise money. That's the challenges of which we see in this particular deal, and that speaks of the importance of the integration of the financial markets. We look at, uh, we understand financial integration as a situation where 
there are no frictions that discriminate between economic agents in their access to and their investment of capital, particularly on the basis of their locations. So nobody has a, a particular monopoly in a particular area, particular field, open for everyone. That is the basic spirit behind integration. This means that financial integration is achieved when uh, there is equal market access, de facto and de jure. Not in terms of theory, not in terms of papers, but it is also in practice. It may mean the law of one price, provided that these assets have similar cash flows and affected by similar risk factors. So, the more the markets are integrated, you will find prices are becoming more or less same. Of course, we have to adjust for the risk. If you look at the integration and the impact of the integration, you'll find the prices across the world of the various financial instruments and the commodities, they are moving very close to each other. That just means that the last few years, uh, I should not say few years, last 15, 20 years, you'll find the degree of the integration has really increased and that is clearly reflected in these diagrams where the movements are very, very close. Rates are converging, uh, lending rates are converging and uh, when I say rates are converging, of course, uh, you have to adjust for the foreign exchange fluctuations and all that. So that speaks that, yes, the integration is increasing. And when something is increasing, it must be because of the fact that we believe strongly it's very essential for us. Something which is not essential for us, something which has no reason for us, it cannot exist. If it is existing and its presence is increasingly there, that means it is having a very, very important role to play in the markets. The driving force behind the financial integration is a do whatever in which you are the best and thereby maximize the welfare of everyone. <coughs> the theory of integration based on law of comparative advantage. If I do the best in which I am the best, somebody else is doing the best in which he is the best, and we exchange, then everyone gets the advantages of the best. That is the basic idea of the financial integration. Okay, and when we talk about financial integration, means some uh, flows of capital, flows of money across the world. Don't forget, money is a very strong, solid, liquid matter, and it is attracted by returns. So wherever they find high returns, they are attracted to that particular place. Very strong, you know, attractors are there, and uh, that's you know, pulling the money in this particular global market scenario. Whenever we have the financial integration, it means uh, we have the information sharing among the financial institutions that reduces the symmetry of information and reduces the cost of transactions and risk. Sharing of best practices among the financial institutions. Sharing of cutting edge technologies among financial institutions. Firms borrow and raise funds directly in the international capital market. There are some of the you know, plus, pluses of having uh, financial integrations. Investors directly invest in the international capital markets and uh, no bound. We can get the best wherever it is available and we can maximize the shareholders or stakeholders value. Newly engineered financial products are domestically innovated and originated, then sold and bought in the international markets. Your innovations, your ideas are not welcomed within the local boundaries, it's welcome everywhere. And that's possible because of uh, integration of the markets. Rapid adoption of uh, newly engineered financial products among uh, financial institutions in different economies. Cross-border capital flows, foreign participation in the domestic financial markets. There are some of the characteristics of uh, integrated markets. Financial integration is good because uh, it does what is called a consumption smoothing. So if there is some problem in our country, suppose we have 
problems and we have lower growth rates and we are not able to get good returns and thereby we are having a low level of consumption, what we can do. We can go to countries where we can get higher returns and loss of consumption in our country will be compensated by the gains which we get outside. And thereby we can smooth out our consumption and smooth out our consumption pattern in a particular economy. Risk diversification and uh, of course uh, monies are flowing where the returns are. Money is also flowing in order to reduce the risk and get the advantages of diversification. I know people used to say, don't put your money in one asset, put in different assets. Now they say, not only different assets, you have to also look at different geographies, different economies, if you are really looking for diversification of risk. At the moment you have diversification of risk, risk reduces, cost of borrowing reduces, and that how you can you know, leverage on the advantages of integrated markets. Efficient allocation of capital, because uh, you know what is the best place for uh, getting the return, and thereby you can have the allocation of capital. Charts uh, which are showing the gains of uh, integrated market in terms of uh, net private capital flows, net FDI flows, net official capital flows, net portfolio investments, net banking flows, GDP growth, and you will find as uh, integration is increasing, all these parameters are becoming bullish and uh, we are getting positive results out of it. Effect uh, when countries open their stock market to foreign investors on investment, it will find the immediately the inflows started increasing, and you can use that money for your own growth purposes. So yes, uh, liberalisation is paying good results, good fruits, and uh, people are getting funds from abroad and using for their own growth and development. You take a. Uh, any country which is uh, more integrating with the world markets and you will find these gains have started coming in. If you look at the Indian markets uh, are also increasingly becoming integrated with the world markets and uh, not only the researchers, even the RBI recognizes the advantages of this kind of integration. These are the things we have taken and the high degrees of correlation shows that our economies are highly correlated with the other world economies and that shows the degrees of integration. In spite of huge uh, visible benefits of the financial integration, true benefits are really not pouring in. If we love to have uh, integration, we love to have financial integration. People talk that we should have financial integration, but there are certain puzzling effects which are showing that, in spite of talking to a lot about integration, the results of integrations are not coming up. So let's have a look at some of these puzzling uh, effects, which we are calling it puzzles. One is uh, felt in Hurika puzzle that says uh, high saving investment correlations. Though we are free to save and invest anywhere, but the researchers are showing even the local economies are having very high degree of long run relationship between the savings and investments. That is to say, whatever is being saved is being invested within the same country. And that's why we have a very high degree of relationship. If the markets are integrated, if all markets are related to each other, why flows are not happening? Why India's money is not going out? Why US money is not continuously coming to India for a long time? Short term, yes, you may find some effect here and there, but long run relationship between saving and investment is not happening. Why? That's something puzzling us, the economists. Risk sharing puzzles, low consumption correlations. We say that uh, if there is uh, some problem in a particular country, because of that there is less consumption, 
and uh, people can invest outside, get more return and thereby compensate for the consumption. That's not happening. So local shocks are not being you know, transferred to the others. And that's what we call as a risk sharing puzzle. Then we have a Lucas paradox. Uh, capital does not flow from rich to poor. Rich people, excess money, low marginal capital, no, low marginal return on their capital, poor, less capital, higher marginal return. Why money is not moving from low marginal return areas to high marginal return? Why poor are not able to get a lot of money from the rich? It's still a puzzle. We don't know how to resolve it. We have some explanation. People say because of the symmetry of information, psychological effect, patriotism, all those things may be working, but why they work when you, the whole world is before you? That's a person. One bias and equity. People don't like to invest outside. Though we have an opportunity to invest outside, but we have a bias towards Indian. We have bias towards you know, local equity shares. We prefer to invest within India as compared to investing outside. We feel more comfortable putting money in Indian equity rather than foreign equity. And that bias is not in India, it's across. But why it's happening, we don't know. That's the person. Consumption correlation puzzle, country specific output risk should be significantly pulled when markets are financially integrated. Therefore, domestic consumption should not depend upon country specific shocks, but that's happening. That's a puzzle. Why is happening? We don't know. So, we love to have integration, we get love to have the fruit of the integration, but it's not happening the way it should happen. And some puzzling effects are there, and we call them as puzzles of the financial integration. So far, so good. Integration looks to be a great thing, but don't forget it has the other side, the con side or the negative side. Procyclical capital inflows. The moment there is a shock, immediately the money goes out and creates more problem. That the experience of the South East is the crisis, that's the experience we, fail, we find in India. The moment there is something wrong, and immediately the money goes out and we cry. Credit crisis, a more crisis used to be one in a decade, now five years, months in a five years, three years in a five years. The periodicity of the crisis has started increasing. Capital does not always seem to flow the right direction. One of the, hypoth one of the premise on which we have the concept of integration is we will have the best allocation of the capital, but that's not happening. The capital, the direction in which the capital should flow, the capital is not flowing in that particular area. And therefore, what is the point in having that kind of integration when we cannot get those desired results? The most serious problem is the financial of the financial integration is financial contagion. If there is a flow in US, not in our Indian market paper trade. I mean it's like a contagion uh, disease. If something catches somewhere, some disease, it spreads all over. So now for India, the problem is not only you have to solve your own economic problems, you have to solve somebody else's problems as well. That's the price we are paying when we have the integration of the markets. Contagion effect is spreading. You take the European crisis, you take the subprime crisis, contagion effect is very, very prominent and spreading like everything. Now managing economics is becoming difficult, increasingly difficult, more challenging, and creating problems in achieving the stated objectives of the economy. And sometimes people started thinking again, you know, why we went for the integration. Let's retrospect and try to find out is it the right strategy to have the integrated markets or not. 
Financial contagion is a scenario in which small shocks, which initially affect only a few financial institutions or a particular region of an economy, spread to the rest of financial sectors and other countries whose economies were previously healthy in a manner similar to the transmission of a medical disease. That's a fallout of the integration. That's the darker side of the integration, I should say. By the way, who are the people looking for integration? Do you think operators are looking for integration? If the markets are highly correlated, if you we, if we find you know, perfect correlation among the markets, do you think I'm going to get the advantage of diversification? Obviously not. I get diversification advantage when I find the markets are either having low correlations or negative correlations. If everyone is having the same relationship, whenever when one economy goes down, every economy goes down, if that kind of scenario is happening, we don't get any gains of diversification. As Professor, uh, as Professor Prashad was saying, regulate, then deregulate, again you regulate. You know why, why this kind of a demand? If you regulate, I will make money. Once the profit stop coming from the regulation, I demand deregulation. Then I make money. When I stop getting money from deregulation, I start demanding regulation. Because that's the way I get the money. I mean, who are the people looking for integration? Do you think the operators are looking for the integration? Do you think the speculators are looking for integration? Who are looking for integration? We, academicians, regulators, small investors, but who cares for them? Is it a you know, fashion to talk to about integration or is it something in the heart of the people who matters in the policy make, making and who matters in the market? Are they really interested in having integration? We say that our market should be open to everyone, but you talk to the US, you will say no. Capital integration, yes. Labor integration, no. Cultural integration, no. What kind of liberalization, liberalization we are talking about? If we are looking for liberalization, for whom we are looking for liberalization? This, this question we should ask again and again ask us. And you'll find that operators, big operators, speculators, big you know, hedge funds, they're not interested in having uh, integration. They are looking for frictions, barriers, so that they can make money and uh, others cannot make money. So far, so good. Financial integration is good, financial integration is bad, but what is our role in the whole exercise? So let's devote some time and understand this. It says, I feel my family's need are a priority. I'm not comfortable with the idea of serving the many and ignoring my family. Liberalization is a good idea. Working for the world is a good idea. But don't ignore your own family's requirement. Don't ignore what India wants. Because that, is, that should be the priority for us. What kind of India we are looking at? Even if the markets are integrated, don't lose on the side as Indians what we want for our country. That is something all the time we have to keep in mind. And that's how we have to work out our policies of integration and liberalization. So in the rest of financial integration, we should not lose the sight of our own country, India, but before that, we have to ask our question. In the level of financial integration, we have to work for our own country. We cannot forget India. But what kind of India are we looking at? That's very, very important for us. If we don't have a reason about India, we can't come out with policies that will work for India. Are we looking for this kind of India, which is a full of corruptions and many times it will change what is happening. 
or are we looking for a bright India? <coughs> what kind of India we are looking at? We are responsible for building India and we are looking for a bright India. And we, the teachers and the students and the policy makers, all have a responsibility to work in this particular direction. And in this context, I have some imperatives for you. And we believe that we all will work in that particular direction. So there are some imperatives uh, for us as a future builder of India. Always remember financial markets are supporting real markets. Real markets are prime, financial markets are just supporting them. The day you started feeling that financial markets are everything, forget about real markets, you can never achieve the sustainable real growth. If you believe that everything is in the stock market, nothing exists beyond it, you cannot come out with pride in here. You have to have a strong feeling and understanding. It is a real market that works for the good of a country and not the financial market, which are just supporting the real markets. Imperative number two, finance makes a sense only and only when it is connected with the real economy. And the day you find there is a disconnect between the financial markets and the real markets, you have a bubble and you have a crisis. So all the time keep in mind, please don't allow the situations to have at any point of time a disconnect between the real markets and the financial markets. You cannot be strong in finance unless and until you are quantitatively strong. Finance these days, economics these days is uh, quantitative. When Professor Prashant was saying that the U.S. is having a university exclusively for forecasting, what for? That means the numbers, the models, the quantitatives are becoming increasingly important in modeling the realities. And if, as a student of finance, we are not strong in that quantitative part, you will not be able to appreciate the implications of complexities of the finance. So as a student of finance, we should be good in uh, quantitatives, we should be good in analytics, we should be good in you know, modeling. Make your analytics strong and develop your analytical capabilities, that's very, very important. Become an expert in computers, especially in Excel, because without that you can't imagine you could be a good finance person. And finally, which is very, very important for all of us, be a person of high integrity and sincerity. The whole world of finance is based on the trust and faith. The moment there is no trust, it will just collapse. And people will have a trust and faith on you if you are a person of sincerity, if you are a person of integrity. You have to be honest for yourself, you have to be honest for the others. If that kind of persons are coming in the financial sectors are confident, we cannot have skills. The scams are there because we don't have the people of integrity, we don't have the people with you know, sincerity. And be dedicated and committed. That is you know, something which is expected from the systems, the financial systems. So I'm sure and confident now you can fulfill all these uh, imperatives because you have to build a India, the futuristic India, the pride India. Yes, you can do it because you are the persons who can do it and I am confident that you can do it. If you do it, success will be with you and you will be successful. Thank you very much.